we're recording now. Good morning, Alex. Uh, how are you today? Yeah, good morning, Noreen. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. Uh, I want to uh, welcome everyone to the Healthy Peaceful podcast. Uh, and today I have a wonderful guest. Uh, his name is Alex Jack. Uh, for those of you in the macrobiotic community, uh, his name needs no further introduction. Uh, but in order to, uh, but for everyone, all other listeners and viewers, I'd like to um, give you a little bit of background about Alex. Uh, Alex is an author, teacher, and he's a dietary counselor of macrobiotics. Uh, he's the founder and president of Planetary Health which is a nonprofit that sponsors Amber Wave's grassroots campaign to preserve whole grains from GMOs, climate change, and other threats. Uh, Alex, along with his uh, collaborators, holds conferences and seminars on diet, health, and sustainability, uh, is engaged in publishing, and conducts medical research. Um, Let's see, uh, Alex served as a civil rights worker in Mississippi, the Vietnam War correspondent, editor in chief of the East West Journal, director of the One Peaceful World Society, executive director of the Cushy Institute. Um, he serves on the guest faculty of Rose's Contemporary Dance Company in Brussels, the Cushy Institute of Europe, and Osawa Center in Tokyo. He's also presented at the Zen Temple in Beijing, the Cardiology Institute of St. Petersburg, and Shakespeare's New Globe Theater in London. Very well-rounded. Uh, Alex, Alex has many books uh, in his long-term collaboration with Michio Kushi. His major works include The Cancer Prevention Diet, One Peaceful World, The Gospel of Peace, Jesus' Teaching of Eternal Truth with Michio Kushi, The Mozart Effect, Tapping the Power of Music to Heal the Body, Strengthen, strengthen the Mind, and Unlock the Creative Spirit with Don Campbell. He has, has additions and commentaries on Hamlet and As You Like It by Christopher Marlowe and William Shakespeare. The One Peaceful World Cookbook with Sachi Cato and the Golden Dream cook, Cookbook co-written with Bettina Zumduk. Um, and Alex currently resides in the Berkshires, an area of Western Massachusetts. Did I leave anything out, Alex? Uh, if you did, I, I didn't. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Um, Okay, so um, I'd like to start actually um, just about, you know, what's happening in terms of, um, we're now into the sixth month with COVID-19 uh, and we've all been reading articles about improving immunity um, and, um, you know, what makes sense so tell me from a math, macrobiotic perspective, I know you've recently written two articles. Um, one of the articles is reducing the risk of COVID-19 diet, the missing link. Um, do you want to speak a little bit about, you know, what you, you kind of the highlights of that particular article? And I can also just chime in as to what spoke to me. Sure. Thank you, uh, Noreen. Yeah, the, the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, very unfortunately, uh, is just one of several new uh, novel viral and uh, microbial epidemics that we faced. You might say since um, the early 1980s, we had AIDS, uh, we've had Ebola, we've had Zika, we've had SARS, we had uh, um, you know several other, I think the swine flu uh, epidemic. Um, so this is not new. Unfortunately, uh, this is a worldwide pandemic. It's not regional. And it's already now claimed worldwide over a million lives and over 200,000 lives in the United States. And um, there are several aspects of, of COVID that I think most people are not aware of. I think from the macrobiotic view, what we find is that all of these epidemics uh, have a an agricultural foundation, so to speak. Mm. And secondly, they also lend themselves to dietary, uh, you might say, prevention or treatment. Mm -hmm. The first point about the origin of corona or AIDS or Ebola, uh, again, these are viruses, but from the macrobiotic view, the viruses are the carrier, they're the transmitter. 
of the of the disease and and viruses don't just appear out of nowhere uh, there's a tendency mm -hmm. in modern science to say that and that this is a mutated virus that has a random kind of origin mm. the point is though that that viruses for the most part come out of the soil and they okay. live in harmony for the most part with other microbes mm -hmm. with fungi with uh, other plants and animals, with insects, birds. And for example, we all know that in Central Africa, AIDS <clears throat> began when SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus, um, was picked up by chimpanzees mm -hmm. and then it, uh, was eaten by uh, humans and it got into their blood system and it became mm -hmm. HIV. Human yes. immunodeficiency mm -hmm. virus. Um, and, but if you look at where the actual virus comes from, again, it comes from, from the soil, it comes from the forest, it comes from you know, the, that ecosystem, which has been ravaged for, for decades, uh, for really several centuries, by slavery, by colonialism, uh, by chemicals, and now most recently by monoculture farming. Mm -hmm. so the area where, where HIV, SIV comes from, you have, for example, huge plantations for bananas, for um, other commodity crops. Mm. And it's still a, a little bit of a mystery where the SIV came from, which particular crop. but. Uh, Ebola, which came out uh, a little bit later, and now we've had two major uh, rounds of Ebola in West and Central Africa, has uh, been identified with um, bananas as the number one source. Mm -hmm. and, and not only bananas, but banana plantations, monoculture. Because what happens is when you have chemicals, uh, then that kills to a large extent uh, what they consider to be the harmful viruses that may attack uh, a monoculture. Polyculture, uh, the viruses uh, live in harmony with mm. many other types of microbes because you have a whole mixture of crops. So mm -hmm. you have what we call checks and balances. It's something yeah. like in principle, United States form of government, where you have the judiciary, the legislature, mm -hmm. the executive. Right that are right. all kind of have a check on each other. Mm -hmm. But if you had only one body, which is what we're, in fact we're facing right now, to some extent we have an executive kind of out of control and mm -hmm. the other two bodies have little power, if any, the whole system begins to- uh, It becomes very lopsided. It becomes very lopsided and unsustainable and right. leads to abuse and corruption and everything else. So that's very similar to what happens in the soil. You know, that when you start growing one crop, uh, especially when you use chemicals, it kills 99.9% .9 mm -hmm. of the predator uh, virulent microbes, but the, the remaining 0.001% become stronger. They mm -hmm. resist, so they become yeah. more bold. They become more right. virulent, they become more toxic. Um, and so that's effectively what happens. So you get a, an arms race, basically. Mm. So bringing, bringing that into wound, uh, to China and to the uh, COVID-19, um, you wrote in your article about what was happening in the surrounding um, agricultural areas. Yeah, um, it, the, okay, let me just address mm -hmm. that. Pandemic mm -hmm. in China began in Wuhan, mm -hmm. which is a large city of 11 million people in central China on the Yangtze River. It's also mm -hmm. often called the Chicago of China. It's about the same size and it's a big uh, you know, commercial trading center as is mm -hmm. Chicago. Uh, however, the virus itself did not originate there. It originated 2,000 kilometers away to the Southwest mm -hmm. in an agricultural province known as Hunan. And it's now been linked to bats. Mm -hmm. And originally they thought that the bats uh, carrying the virus came from a wet market, uh, uh, right. a market for exotic uh, foods. Yes. That the Chinese who are, who are kind of notorious for eating all and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but 
uh, later the Chinese government did a more careful study and they found that most of the people who got the initial uh, round of, of coronavirus had no connection directly or indirectly with the market. Mm -hmm. so the Chinese government itself has now distanced itself from that theory. Okay. The second major theory is that it originated in a laboratory in Wuhan. There are yes, two laboratories. Mm -hmm. One is conducting uh, normal viral research and one is conducting bio-war research. Mm -hmm. And uh, the bio-war research, interestingly, has been conducted to some extent with the cooperation of the United States government. Okay. It's not like it was developing something to be used against the United States or potential uh, adversaries. Mm -hmm. But they do study uh, these um, uh, virulent vi viruses and even experiment on them. And, and the jury is a little bit still out on, on whether it originated, wouldn't be originated, but it would be tweaked, you might say, mm. in the laboratory. Uh, but in any event, the virus did originate in uh, Wuhan and uh, China actually did announce uh, late this summer that the first six cases of COVID turned up in 2012. Six, um, no, eight years, I guess, before, the, the second, yeah, it, before it manifested in Wuhan. Sure, yeah. The symptoms are very similar, the respiratory symptoms and mm -hmm. six minors uh, who were in a bat cave came down mm. with yeah. really the, uh, the transmitter. Mm. Now, now, again, the question is, where do the bats pick it up? You know, yes, that, that is a, that is the crux. Yeah, and 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 my theory, and it remains my theory, but it it follows the Ebola theory and some of these other theories around the world, where it's definitely been established that agriculture is the foundation. Is that in Wuhan in recent years, uh, the monoculture has come in and replaced traditional Chinese polyculture. You know, look, you see all the beautiful terraced um, uh, plots in, in uh, Yunnan and other parts of China, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. With all different types of foods growing together. Sure. Well, well, you know, those have now been replaced to a large extent by these huge plantation-like mm -hmm. monocultures as we have, for example, in South America and the Amazon and right. many other parts of the world where they grow just one crop. Mm -hmm. and they're all heavily chemicalized. They use more pesticides now in Yunnan, five times more than the world average. Okay. And in fact, this has uh, resulted in certain types of, of other outbreaks of health problems mm -hmm. in, 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 uh, in any event, the theory is that uh, pesticides are used to kill insects and to a lesser extent birds or even bats that may, may go into the fields and eat the crops. Right. Either. Yeah. So to, pre to preserve the crops. To preserve the crops. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that these bats are very interesting. They're called horseshoe bats. Mm. And um, these bats, their, their main uh, food is insects. Versus fruit. Versus fruit. Their right. there many bats are fruit bats. For example, the, the Ebola bat is a fruit bat. Okay. Whereas, the, so in other words, they're more like vegan versus paleo. Right, right. Yeah. I like that. I like that. That that could be the title of a new article. Exactly. So you've got these <gasps> paleo bats um, in in uh, China. Now the right. question is, what happens when when paleo bats uh, and the viruses and uh, the insects that they eat have been subjected to these heavy chemicals? So that's mm -hmm. in effect, I think, where the mutations come. Mm. That the, that the coronavirus then becomes mutated as a result of its contact with these chemicals. Mm -hmm. And then the bats pick it up. The bats themselves are not affected. They're just carriers. Right, and they're picking it up from the insects. They're pick, that's my theory. Mm -hmm. They're picking it up from the insects. But bats, interestingly, are mammals. They're not birds. Right. And, and so what happens in mammals, because they're warm-blooded, is that they, they incubate. Mm. Because of yeah, bats. but you're also sure. bats in the caves. They huddle together. Yes, you know, the yes. Social distance <laughs> <laughs> for, for warmth. So for there's warmth. a yeah. yeah. So yeah. in other words, that 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 magnifies it, amplifies the virus. 
Mm. It's like it's a it's kind of like cooking the virus. Cooking exactly. It's mm. a cooker. Same thing actually happened in in uh, Central Africa with the fruit bat, and this has been well established by the African and, and WHO scientists in Africa that the fruit bats picked up the uh, virus for Ebola from the fields, again, the chemicalized fields of bananas, and they incubated it. Mm -hmm. And then it, uh, then through the, the droppings of the bats uh, in both places, evidently then through urine, through feces, through uh, saliva, Sure. Uh, you know, it gets into the human food system, not, mm -hmm. not just directly by eating the bats, but I... it contaminates whatever it falls on or some other animal picks it up. And mm -hmm. back in Africa, they, there was an intermediate animal. I think in the case of Ebola, you had monkeys, which actually yes, picked, yes. picked it up. You don't have that as far as we know in China. And that's my theory why it's not as deadly as... Why? as in Africa, in Africa, you had three mammals. I yeah, that was interesting because you were analyzing China. There were two. There were two, yeah. Versus three, so the exponential impact is lesser. So logarithmically, it increases right. with mammal. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then and then the secondary animal. This is even almost as interesting. It's in China. The secondary transmitter is this tiny little animal called a pangolin. Mm, yeah, any of it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a anteater or some sort of anteater. A scaly, tiny, miniature anteater. Right. Yes, so, mm -hmm. yeah, so what does it eat? It eats insects. Mm -hmm. and again, they're subject to chemicals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So again, it, it can pass through the pangolins. Um, but I think the pangolins don't have quite as wide a what, territory as the bats. Yes, uh, yes, they don't. They're 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 uh, they're ground bearing versus airborne. Exactly. They're, um, okay. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, they they appear to be the secondary route of transmission. Mm -hmm. Okay. So again, this is a hypothesis, but it stands to reason, and there are all kind of you might say case histories. I'll just mention one in in mm -hmm. uh, Argentina. I think in the, even in the 70s or 80s, uh, they started having a, what was called Argentine hemorrhagic fever, mm. which is very similar to Ebola. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a very uh, lethal disease that created all kind of hemorrhaging and, you know, very um, violent and deadly. And they finally traced it to the maize fields, the corn fields. Mm. Again, they turned on monoculture, they brought in the chemicals, and the chemicals, the end result was that the virus, this particular virus, uh, which they call, I guess, just the corn virus, got out of control and was picked up by a mouse. Mm. Uh, yes. A corn mouse or maize mouse, uh, which then it infected the human food system. Mm. And that was a very direct link. So mm -hmm. we've seen this now in Africa and South America, and I, I'm afraid we're seeing it now in China. Mm. The, the, the connection between um, the industrial food system, monoculture, um, the destruction of the natural habitat, um, the animals are, are you know, it's, it, it's essentially creating an unbalanced system. Exactly, yeah. And I think the you might say on the other end of the epidemic, then if you look at you know who's who's susceptible, who gets sick. Yes, yeah, let's yes, let's move to that. Almost the same, this the same process. Mm -hmm. you know, it just differs because the people who are getting sick in this case. Uh, we know now, eighty I think eighty eight percent. That's the number usually uh, talked about. Eighty eight percent of those who die. Mm. at least in the United States so far from coronavirus have what we call pre-existing condition. Okay? Yes, yeah. Number one is diabetes. You know, mm -hmm. you have heart disease, you have cancer, you have metabolic disorder, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of a combination of all of those and, and other types of chronic conditions. Mm -hmm. so, and, the, and underlying many of them is, is the epidemic, the obesity epidemic. And the obesity mm -hmm. That's right, obesity, mm -hmm. which, which affects what uh, two thirds of all American adults and one third mm -hmm. of American children. Mm -hmm. So this is a recipe for 
for a disaster at a viral level. Mm. And again, if you look at the, uh, when we look at the, the microbiome, you know. Right, uh, our, our, our gut, the health of our gut. Our health, the, the gut health of the American people and many people now around the world is extremely compromised. Mm. And that gut health, <clears throat> uh, the large intestine primarily, but it's also really body-wide. It can be the lungs, it can be anything else you know, where you have, again, a synergistic system of mm. uh, virus and bacteria and all kinds of other microbes uh, that live, you know, in, in harmony with our blood, our lymph, and all our other immune factors. And in good health, it's all symbiotic. Yes. But taking chemical food, or what today we call ultra-processed food, mm. which 40% of the modern diet now is ultra-processed, and that includes yeah. not only animal food, but it includes uh, plant food, it includes junk vegan food. It's sure, food. sure, sure. It's not, it's, it's not limited to animal food. It's not limited to animal food. Mm -hmm. but, but anyway, so I think, again, what we're seeing is that people with compromised natural immunity from chemicals uh, are the ones who are most at risk now mm -hmm. for, for this virus to, to, to find a stronghold or a niche in mm. which and then uh, grow and multiply. Sure, and like to like the um, our agricultural system. You know, on the big on the larger level, um, our per, the personal ecosystem has become unbalanced. Yeah, that's a good re relating to also in our industrial food system essentially. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good term. I like that personal ecosystem. Mm -hmm. you might say, you know, corresponds to the planetary or the regional ecosystem. It's a microcosm, macrocosm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So really, both ends are very, very similar. Sure. And so the, the, the solution to uh, COVID and similar types of, of epidemics uh, then at both ends is to return to a more natural, organic uh, way of farming and, and eating. Mm-hmm. So it's very clear that, you know, it's a very uh, simple solution in a way. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so that was, that was your first article, which was um, reducing the risk of COVID-19 diet, the missing link. Um, and then um, let's see, your article, your second article was the anatomy of, of an epidemic. Um, and you talk about uh, Michio Kushi's prediction in 2014 that there will be one more new viral epidemic before the spiral of history peaks in 20 years and it will spread worldwide. Do you want to, do you want to touch on that briefly? Obviously, it came true. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Michio Kushi uh, was, was an educator and uh, kind of the uh, foremost promoter of modern macrobiotics, mm -hmm. which is kind of an, an age-old, timeless philosophy of living naturally. And uh, I worked with him for, for many years, and, and, and uh, in fact, we, I recently wrote a book based on, on his teachings and, and work that we did together called Spiral of History. But in any event, um, shortly before he died, uh, I think it was uh, Ebola, had, had broken out mm -hmm. in 2014. And I went into Boston where he was living uh, to talk to him and get his uh, dietary guidelines mm. for the epidemic. And um, at that time, he said that uh, after he gave me the guidelines, and then we published those and we, we did a dedicated website called uh, EbolaAndDiet.com, which is still up. And um, he just, Ebola, that's Ebola and diet.com. Ebola and diet.com. Yeah. And I'll include all of that in the show links. Yeah, that would be good. Show notes. In fact, we're doing a new one right now called coronavirus and diet.com. So great. Perfect. Yeah. Um, but anyway, he just, he just predicted that there would be one, probably be one more uh, worldwide pandemic. Mm -hmm. Ebola was limited to uh, Central and West Africa. 
Right, right. And, uh, but uh, he did say there'd probably be one more that would be uh, uh, global and worldwide. Mm -hmm. But he said he felt that, that uh, a more holistic approach would ultimately be recognized because he felt it really was the only uh, lasting solution. Mm. That uh, eventually um, society would make the connection. I think it's true, as you well know now, Noreen, that over the last generation, society has kind of connected the dots between uh, chronic disease and diet. No doubt. Yeah, so the, the, we're well aware of that. It's just that it takes one further. They definitely connected the dots, but I'm not, yeah. But they're not making that connection sure. right now uh, with corona, that that is the way to prevent it. In other words, if you could bring down uh, uh, susceptibility from 88%, you know, to 78%, to 58%, to 18%, right? Hello? Uh-oh. You're, we've frozen. Okay, we were frozen. For a minute. I, I know, I, I, I'm not sure. Is something that happened with the internet. I can hear you now. Okay, well, okay, good. Continue. Yep. Yeah, anyway, what I'm saying was that if we can, if society could bring down the susceptibility rate, see, from, from, from 88% to a much lower number, mm -hmm. you know, save, again, huge amount of lives. Right. It's very simple to bring that down through dietary changes. Mm. Yes. So that's the point. And, and some of, you know, the research and studies we've, we've been involved with, you were involved with at the KI and so forth, you know, is within six months or one year, uh, you know, most of those conditions can be brought down from, you know, from, from critical to, or chronic to, you know, likely to, to uh, steady or uh, uh, very unlikely. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, 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 no, so that, I, that. Yeah, so that would be, that would be a way to, to approach this epidemic. Like I do support, you know. Sure. Do you think people are more open to it now? I think they will be. Yeah. I think you know, in the in the heat of the moment, because of the shock of the of the epidemic, you know, like any acute um, situation, you know, it was, you know, it was immediately everybody hunkered down. What could you do to protect yourself? You know, you wear a mask. You so of course mask, you do whatever, you know. Yeah. So, so, but it took a while for it beginning to sink in that, you know, that there longer term things that actually are not so long term, but you know, in terms of months even that we can do to yes, yes. reduce this. Yeah. And it's interesting that just in the last uh, I would say month or so that the CDC and the WHO both issued the first dietary guidelines for COVID. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very, very mild. They just said yeah. that there's a relation between what you eat and natural immunity. So that was the CDC and you said the World Health Organization? Yeah, yeah, they're very, very mild. They, right. they, you know, they just gave a few examples like vitamin C or vitamin A or vitamin D, you know. Right, the, the, the stuff that we're, we're reading on the internet. Antioxidant types of things that, you know, people sure. use for general good health. Mm -hmm. But I'm hopeful that in the future, you know, that, that they'll look a little more deeply and begin to see that you can do much, much more than just, you know, vitamin supplementation or, of course, whole foods with those vitamins are a much better way to go. Mm -hmm. um, and meanwhile, there are quite a few uh, uh, scientists who are now studying the relation of food and corona. And they found, for example, that certain types of foods uh, have brought down uh, susceptibility. For example, in Europe, they found it in those countries that have a tradition of eating fermented foods, particularly, mm. for example, Germany with sauerkraut. Right, right. That the actual, right across the board, the uh, rate of corona is much less mm -hmm. than other countries. Mm. You know, like the southern part of Europe, they don't eat sauerkraut. Yeah, yeah. The, the uh, relation between immunity and microbiome and exactly. both looking, I know in your book, um, which I also will include in the, um, oh. I'll include that in the show notes as well. 
Strengthening Natural Immunity, a Plant-Based Macrobiotic Approach, uh, co-written with Edward Esco and Bettina Zemdek, and a forward by Martha Cottrell, um, Dr. Martha Cottrell, MD. Um, the importance of both uh, prebiotics and probiotics to um, uh, ensuring that we have a healthy gut and that the microbiome is, um, is in, a, in a balanced state versus imbalanced. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So we're finding that now with a variety of other foods. Another one is uh, natto, mm -hmm. which is a, a fermented soy food. Uh, that's eaten in the Far East. It's now in many health food stores here in this country. Mm -hmm. and, and they find this, the same, same thing, that people who are taking natto uh, have reduced uh, COVID so, or higher natural immunity. Okay, yeah, yeah. And natto is actually um, fermented soybeans. It's fermented soybeans. Yeah, so yeah. Direct link with the microbiome there. Okay, all right. Great. Um, just to see if there's anything else in that particular article. Um, oh, I, I thought it was interesting that this particular book, uh, in the article, this is again the article, The Anatomy of an Epidemic. You indicated that you had published this book in the article and that um, you said that Amazon wouldn't publish it under your original title, including COVID-19 in the title. Yes, the originally uh, I think we had a uh, the title was I don't know something like coronavirus and, and diet. Sure, they, they refused to accept it. Okay, and uh, you know which is blatantly uh, illegal and uh, sure in the First Amendment. Yeah, yeah, but, and that was in the first throes of the epidemic, and the yeah. Trump administration had said you know that they didn't want any fake. That uh, uh, remedies out there, you know, that was before they started retailing their own. Oh, right, right, right. And, uh, so we, we, we adjusted, we didn't, you know. You, just, you decided we, not to bring that to the Supreme Court. Yeah, we could have asked you to represent us. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, uh, but I, I think your move was wise to dedicate your energy in other directions. I think so, yeah. So, but if you look at Amazon right now, there are a thousand and one titles with COVID in the, in the. Oh, title. okay. So that's so that's that's. that's point, right. There was a flood; they couldn't hold it back anymore. Yeah, or somebody actually brought it to court. Um, oh, I the the other thing I thought um, was interesting that you indicated that um, that even many. Um, macrobiotic teachers, counselors, that you felt that some of their views were antisocial or not very compassionate. The, your, the quote I'm quoting, it's nature's way, referring to Corona, of culling the herd, implying that the old sick hamburger lovers, ice cream addicts were, are expendable. Um, I guess my question is to what do you attribute such Antisocial or less compassionate views of um, humanity or those that who who are suffering. Yeah, that's a good question. Where does it come from? But I think to some extent, I mean, it's obviously it's socialization. Right. You know, we've all been brought up in a in, in the modern world, and we still share you know a lot of the same prejudices and and uh, attitudes and orientation as modern society. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, you know, there's that tendency toward exclusivism or superiority or whatever. You find that in, in groups. I've worked, you know, like you mentioned in the beginning, I was a civil rights worker. I've been in the peace movement for many years. And, mm -hmm. and, and you know, the, the, these are, have wonderful ideals and they've done, done a lot of you know, good work and for social justice and so forth. But within all of these movements, as within society itself, there are all kind of factionalism and internal power struggles and prejudices and discrimination. Sure, and sure. So, forth. so it's, I think in some ways it's to be expected. And, sure. uh, um, you know, my view is, Basically, that that you know that that we have to really uh, reach everyone, of course, and, yeah, and 
you know, the pe people, um, you know, again, I don't want to make eating um, unhealthy food to be sinful. You know, it's very easy to cross a line and, and consider it a, a moral problem rather than yeah, a that's a, a so rather than a social problem. Yeah, so it becomes a original yeah. sin, you know. And, yeah, yeah. And anyway, there's that tendency there. Of course, of course. And I'm, I'm thinking, is that way of, is perhaps that uh, quote, that statement of yours, a way to nudge friends to um, yeah, well, yeah. Recon reconsider their outlook? I would hope so. And to be more inclusive? Yeah, I would hope. Yeah, yeah sure. Cool. You know, within macrobiotic and holistic community, I try to speak out when I find those kinds of of things. You know, as I would speak out about society uh, as a whole. For sure, example, sure. I, I I I I've been very moved by the uh, by by the so-called first responders during this crisis. Oh, absolutely! You know, yeah, you know, the medical people, the doctors, the nurses, and other volunteers. You know, have really stepped up. They have. They've, they've really taken, and they've taken great risk. They're taking great risk and they're dealing it, you know, again, from a macrobiotic view, we would say, well, they're dealing with it, you know, on a Band-Aid level, but you, that's what's called for in the moment. Right? That's uh, absolutely. Triage, uh, triage. Exactly. So they're putting their life on the line. And they so are. That's, that's amazing. And I support yeah. them. And salute them. And, you know, uh, you know, but I would like, you know, over the long run, perhaps, you know, that they would, you know, start integrating a little more nutritional education and so forth. Of course. But I support them completely at this time. Absolutely. I, think I may be in a minority in the macrobiotic community for those kind of views. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, again, I have, um, I would say my views on vaccines and many things are are very distinct minority within the macrobiotic community. Almost everybody right. is almost totally against vaccines. Right. And um, well, I think expanding the circle is important. Yeah. Versus, you know, um, creating creating a sense of exclusivity. So, um, I I think the other thing that's coming up is um, a lot of these conspiracy theories uh, that you referred to in your article. Um, you know, and we've all heard them out there um, that it originated in, you know, we talked about this a little bit already. They originated in a lab. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Trump's attempt to demonize China. Is there anything that you want to say regarding that? Uh, yes, the, the, most, uh, the most current reiteration of the conspiracy theory is that uh, there was a Chinese uh, doctor from Hong Kong mm -hmm. who has defected to the United States and is now making the rounds claiming that uh, the uh, coronavirus uh, was genetically engineered uh, by the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. And she's getting a lot of press on Fox okay. News right. and also on many left uh, wing outlets, both left and right. Okay. So across the board? Across the board. And right. she published uh, a scientific article which she um, was not been peer reviewed and which uh, was taken down actually from Twitter and some other social media. Anyway, she's being claimed as a martyr and as a, you know, as a freedom fighter and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I read her paper. I, it was so technical, I couldn't understand it, I must admit. Right, right. Uh, it was a, it was a it's a scientific paper which scientific uh, paper. where can you look at that paper if, if somebody wants to refer to it I'll have to give, send you the link yeah I'll send you the link to that uh, but any event uh, I have now since then I've read three or four uh, critical analyses uh, by independent media sure. you know, which are not particularly I would say either left or right mm -hmm. including uh, uh, other doctors and so forth. Turns out that uh, she was being bankrolled by Steve Bannon. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Our our uh, our attorney general. Yeah. Or so so called attorney general. Uh. Well. Yeah. Uh, kind of a Trump whisperer. Yeah. 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 Year of Trump. And no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. So that doesn't automatically uh, invalidate 
her experience or conclusion, but it seems like she's been manipulated by Bannon, who has a very anti-Chinese agenda and okay. who is working kind of off the books with Trump. Right, um, right. Yes, yes. He's, um, he's mm -hmm. at this time. Mm -hmm. And most people have not uh, been aware of that connection. But uh, anyway, there have been some very interesting investigative articles just in the last few days, sh again, showing the connections between this woman and uh, who's being funded basically by, you know, the Breibart type of uh, mm -hmm. right wing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I was not aware of this most recent conspiracy. Anyway, again, it, I don't know that it'll take off particularly because I don't know that any other medical people have, have picked up on it. Any other, you know, mm -hmm. independent viral researchers. Yeah. There are quite a few, uh, including some of the, um, the articles I read who, you know, said, who, who agree that the jury's still out about whether there was any, uh, whether the lab, you know, tweaked it. That's still a possibility. Right. And that's, you know, so they're very open to that. But, but they said that this woman did not come up with the evidence. There right. Was, it just, it just, uh, it, things were not adding up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it yeah. was, it was kind of a mishmash. So yeah. Again, I think the jury's out on, on that. I, I think my thesis about the bats in any event, you know, <clears throat> is still true that the bats would have been acquired or they do originate in that province in Yunnan. That's where those particular bats come from. And they did, uh, as I mentioned, the, the disease has now been traced about six or eight years ago prior to this outbreak. Yeah, yeah. And I think in your theory is that it, 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 whether it's a lab or the market, that's, yeah. not, that's not the issue. It doesn't seem to be, at least to me, the issue. Yeah, right. I mean, it could have amplified it further in the lab. But yeah, it it, it's sure. Already a virulent type. But the issue is really the the uh, industrial agriculture. And uh, we have many examples now mm -hmm. around the world in which you know mm -hmm. could happen again in China, could happen again here in uh, uh, Nebraska. You know. Sure. You're... Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Or, or so forth. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I think some of this we already covered. Um, Oh, um, you, let's see, you brought up, um, you talked about the relationship between corona, um, the respiratory susceptibility to the coronavirus, that um, the connection with glyphosate, um, and um, that, you know, the, the, that there was increased susceptibility to contracting the virus. Could you could you speak to that? Yes. Um, yeah. There's a scientist at uh, uh, MIT in in Boston or in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. I forget her name, but anyway, she's been promoting uh, the theory that glyphosate, uh, you know, which is uh, a product uh, that was what trademarked by by Monsanto is around. Mm -hmm. Right. It's the leading uh, herbicide. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's her theory, is that glyphosate uh, is a main cause of susceptibility mm -hmm. because it's so widespread. It's not used only on, on farms, mm. you know, on monocultures, it, though it's the number one, has been the number one herbicide all over the world now. Uh, in fact, in China, it's now generic so that even Chinese companies can make it. Uh, and they do use it in, in Yunnan and elsewhere, but also as she showed, and I didn't know this, is that, uh, uh, you know, you remember ethanol? The yeah, yeah, the biodiesel, or you talked about the biofuels. Yeah. So that actually mm -hmm. in biodiesel now, they, they use uh, glyphosate uh, mm -hmm. crops that have been exposed to glyphosate. So they have traces or they have sometimes this built in is in the GMO variations mm. uh, right into that. So the residue gets into the biodiesel mm. and so it goes into uh, airplane fuel to uh, also for ships mm -hmm. and uh, transportation buses. And anyway, she did a initial 
uh, study about the hotspots for COVID all around the world, and they seem to coincide to cities where they had mass transport or airlines that mm -hmm. were heavily glyphosated. Sure, sure, and and I the you know you said that um, um, eating organic and staying away from major highways may, may be the best tools um, to avoid an acute reaction to COVID-19. That was her conclusion, yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah, 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 the, yeah. Her, yeah she was thinking, again, the exhaust from the automobile right. or the buses or whatever has some kind of particulate matter from glycogen. Sure, sure. You know. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, you know, simply eating organic or, or it's, not, it's not enough. No, no, I don't think it's enough. Yeah. Again, yeah, it's, so uh, it's, it's a foundation to some extent, but, but it's an important factor, but it's not the only factor. But sure. sure. And that also brings in the so socioeconomic. Uh, usually people on the lower echelons of the, the scale, the income scale, are living near highways. They're living near highways and they're living in food deserts. Highways and food deserts. Exactly. Yeah. So they, they don't even have access to healthy food. And again, yeah. you know, so rather than blaming the people, particularly the poor and the underserved people in our country who are proportionally more, more likely to get COVID. Sure. You know, you can't blame them. No, no, they don't. They, they're, they're, they're because of their circumstance, you know, they, they don't have access to healthier foods. They can't afford healthier foods. Yeah. They have the, you know, the, and also just the social, cultural, you know, the milieu. It's the milieu, just, uh, right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. yeah. So again, it's a question of education. Yes. And, you know, these people, you know, we need to reach them, mm -hmm. educate them and, as, and educate ourselves in the process. And I think mm -hmm. in some ways the country right now is going through a huge educational process in which it's working, you know, at, at every level so that, um, you know, the mainstream society is being educated now to the, you know, what minorities have been experiencing now on a day-to-day -day yes. basis as never before. It's, it's, uh, it's, up, it's up front and center. It's assumed center mm -hmm. stage. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, so it's a real education. Yeah. I, I, think, I think that's very good. As long as we can look at it as an educational process rather than the blame game, you know, that you know, you're to blame for this. Right. I think if we can look at it as an opportunity, exactly, uh, versus pushing it away or, um, you know, um, staying in a, a zone of discomfort, which it can it can certainly create that. But um, it's it's really an opportunity for something new, something different, um, and. Yes. Um, um, let's see if there's anything else in that article that, um, you made the statement, I like to think that the crisis is a dress rehearsal for unified planetary action to reduce global warming and climate change. Could you comment on that? Yes. Um, yeah, we're living right now in an, in an era of, of, I guess I call acute nationalism. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we're, we're, and we've seen that over the last seven or eight years, particularly sure, sure. in the United States. You have in England, Britain with Brexit. Yeah, it's not limited to the US. There's no you doubt. have many other countries in Europe that have gone in a more authoritarian direction. India, you know, mm -hmm. has gone authoritarian big time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with the Kashmir situation and. and right. uh, and discrimination against Muslims mm -hmm. in India is terrible what's going on there. And yeah. China, you know, with the Uyghur population, the Muslims in, in West Central China. I mean, mm -hmm. all around the world, you've got, got all of these nationalist, mm -hmm. uh, you know, agendas. Sure. So historically, what happens is that something comes along to bring these countries together so that they are forced to cooperate on a common goal. And and the okay. pandemic was that opportunity. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, and the men to some extent, much of the world did, is cooperating. 
Mm. Of course, people China and Europe are cooperating, and most of, I think, Africa and Latin America are involved, you know, through WHO and other international organizations. Sure. And uh, to some extent, even the vaccine. You know, again, I, I think the jury's out on vaccines. I'm open to it. I'm not, you know, I'll have to look at any given vaccine. Of course. But, but the process itself, they're, they're actually now talking about an equitable way to distribute it so that the poor people at the bottom mm. have the same opportunity as the rich people. At mm -hmm. the and okay. it's kind of thrilling to see those kind of discussions going right. on. Right. Yeah, that is. The that... question of who can afford it. See? So yes. Either the vaccine, you know, is, is no good or harmful, but at least the process looks like on a global level, it'll be fair or fairer than ever before. Meanwhile, the United States has, has, has opted out of that whole process. You know, Trump has doubled down. Yes. So hopefully if, you know, there's a new administration next year, they will, you know, reverse course and join in that, that effort because there's mm -hmm. going to be another, who knows, a year two or longer for this particular epidemic plus future ones. Mm -hmm. So this kind of cooperation is extraordinarily necessary, you know, for a virus that doesn't respect boundaries. Mm. Same thing, of course, is true then with global warming and climate change. Mm. The point is, if we can cooperate on, on, on this level, you know, hopefully that will be kind of exercising a collective muscle for-, for the Yeah, people. yeah, that's, that's a beautiful way to look at it, collective muscle. Yeah. Um, let's see. And your last paragraph I thought was really beautiful. It says, many people consider crows like the coronavirus an evil omen. But by tending a crow gently, as your friend did, natural, natural crisis crises such as COVID-19 may ultimately prove to be our friend and awaken us to create health and well-being. Yeah, I was referring in the article to, to a friend of mine, this uh, dancer in, in Belgium, um, who has, a, has actually a macrobiotic school in, in mm -hmm. Brussels. Okay. And um, anyway, she, she she helped a, an injured crow. Okay. I guess, you know, she found in her house or at the school or whatever. Anyway, she started dancing with the crow and that she, she was telling me that she was amazed because she discovered that the Latin name for the crow was Corona. Oh. Right at the beginning of the coronavirus epidemic. And it became a metaphor. Okay. In other words, because most people, again, they look at crows as pests. See? Right, right. Or they're, they're afraid of crows. Or... They're afraid of crows. Yeah. Crows have a reputation for sure, sure, whatever. But the point was, she befriended the crow, and then the crow became her friend. And mm. and and I mean, that's the point with viruses or anything else is that, mm -hmm. yeah, they can they can wreak havoc and disaster. Yes. But if we if we self reflect, we discover mm -hmm. <laughs> that you know we've created this socially and individually through through our food and agriculture system, our lifestyle and so forth. And and uh, the virus, you know, was just the straw that poked it or uh, broke the camel's back, so to speak, you know, that made us get sick. But if we had taken, made other choices, or if we make other choices in the future, those viruses will be basically harmless. Mm, yes, um, yes. It's it's another opportunity to, to yeah. So evolve. So the virus is our teacher in that regard. It's yeah. not something to be afraid of, but it's something, you know, to wake up to and to, to deal with in a peaceful, harmonious way. Mm -hmm. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. Um, I want to turn now to um, your new book, which I have tabbed in certain parts, so sorry for all the stickies, but uh, this is The Spiral of History, and this was it just came out, it was just published, is that correct? Oh, the subtitle, of course, is The Arc That Bends Toward Justice, Peace, and Love. Uh, when was it, when, when did this book, when was it issued? Uh, well, just this summer. I'm okay, gonna... so, okay, yeah. But you've been working on it um, for a couple of years? I've been working on, on the book for, I would say, three years. I, I worked, actually, with Michio Kushi 
yeah on developing you might say the template for this mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for almost a generation Mitchell yeah. came up with the original idea of the spiral of history looking at history not as a linear progression mm -hmm. there's a cyclical progression mm. but as a spiralic progression so that uh, uh, human affairs unfold in a in a in an arc or a circular fashion but they they have a direction so that it's not the same each each time we go around the circle there's mm -hmm. slight uh, variation uh, okay. and so spiral of history refers to the last 5,000 years of human development mm -hmm. beginning with uh, uh, the uh, emergence of writing and civilization uh, usually attributed to Egypt, Sumer, China, uh, India, Vedic India, uh, the Incas, uh, mm -hmm. pre-Inca Andean civilizations, early civilizations in Mesoamerica. Anyway, that's generally well accepted that that you know that that marked the so-called beginning of history. You know, written yeah. history with writing with symbolic communication. Uh, and uh, but Misha said that I felt that that like everything else in nature, there was a kind of a spiralic form and structure to the unfolding of history. So it wasn't mm. just again a straight line or an up and down kind of line, mm -hmm. but it actually there was a rhythm uh, to it. Mm -hmm. and so that there, you can almost divide it into a clock with 12 hours or sections. Mm -hmm. you know, so you have an initial impulse, uh, kind of an original impulse, mm -hmm. which in that case in 3200 BCE was, uh, writing and farming. It was the beginning of what we call the ag agrarian revolution. Mm -hmm. that unfolded over the next several thousand years, you know, up through Greece and Rome, and uh, generally um, then it led to the Middle Ages, to the rise of Islam, sure. uh, the rise of Christianity in Europe, to the Crusades, and then it ended sort of with the Black Death. So that whole sweep was about, uh, I think it was uh, 40, 4,800 years or something mm -hmm. uh, from, from uh, ancient fer Fertile Crescent to the beginning of the Renaissance. So that was the first big coil in the spiral of revolution. Okay. The second one was the beginning of the Renaissance. And again, mm -hmm. almost all historians and you know, most people would agree that that marked the beginning of a new cycle mm -hmm. which we call the modern age. Sure. And the thing is that, however, for most people today, the modern age is still continuing. We mm -hmm. haven't realized that we're actually the modern age. Uh, that spiral is now over. Well, there's, the, there's still, there's a, there's still a tug, there's still a, um, there, there's a tug back to that, you know, there's many, Oh, of course. They, want, many, they, they want to stay planted in that age. Yeah, there's still strand, many strands there, but actually sure. that age ended around 1980. Yeah. Third age, which we're now in, which is the smallest age, mm. uh, is now the digital era. Mm -hmm. The personal computer came in in the early 1980s. Right. So we tend to see that as a continuation of the Industrial Revolution, but it actually is changing life now at every level. Mm-hmm society and uh it will be industrial era will be as quaint as the ancient farming era was when industrialization and factories first came in I mean, yeah it's you can see it yeah it's already it's uh brick and mortar types of things you know are, are fast disappearing of course and of course is moving online yeah Look and our talk today so you said that that age is much you know some of these other ages were much longer yeah. and this age is, is it started in 1980 yeah so the spiral is contracting meaning mm -hmm. it's 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 accelerating so that mm. the frame, time frame is 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 getting smaller and smaller so you had 4800 years for the ancient and medieval worlds then you had the industrial or modern world you had 1200 1200 years mm -hmm. and now we're having um uh no i'm not i'm sorry well, you have 400 years 
and now you have you know 70 or 80 years for for the mm -hmm. digital era right and for it's the all coming the era. to a climax Mitchell predicted around 2030 to 2040 Mm, yeah, I want to I want to talk about that. But I also want to talk a little bit before I do that is about the origins of there's a precursor to this book. And that's the book that you co wrote with Michio um, titled One Peaceful World. Yes. Could you talk about that a little bit and how how you've um, expanded? Yeah, um, in this particular book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I worked with Micho on One Peaceful World beginning in the uh, early 1980s. Mm -hmm. And that was, you might say, the, the main uh, a book that uh, he wanted to uh, share with people about, again, his interpretation or understanding of history and the need for dietary and lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. And we used the spiral of history as a model in that book. Mm -hmm. it took about 10 pages. Okay. Uh, so and it wasn't. It wasn't a very. It wasn't a very. No, it was very significant. I read the book, but it's been several years since no, I've looked at it. It formed yeah. that kind of the foundation. But okay. here's the interesting thing, in Noreen. Yeah. Nico, in, he's he's he was trying to convey to people the view that human beings are by nature peaceful and harmonious, mm. mm -hmm. not aggressive or warlike, which is you might say the dominant paradigm in 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 modern science. Yes, yes. Sociologists, you have historians, you have um, biologists, right, who are mm -hmm. saying that, that humanity is by nature aggressive and violent and will always have war. Of course. Historical period, 3200 BCE approximately, mm -hmm. to the present day, there have been 14,000 recorded wars in history. Mm. There have been 138 years when there have been no wars. Right, right. So it, it sure looks like 99% of that time human beings were violent. So the, it, it, se so it seems like that statement is true. It seems on the surface. But what right. Mitchell did, because he didn't have, we really didn't have much at that point in the historical era to counter that. Right. Mitchell went back, which again was not, which was part of his teaching all, all along from the beginning, what he called the ancient world. You know, okay. the Paleolithic and the Neolithic world. Sure. And he was really in to uh, what he called, uh, he, he called the ancient uh, spiritual and scientific world civilization. It was a postulated era about 25,000 years ago when the world was unified by kind of a, uh, a holistic megalithic technology. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and it was something like uh, before Atlantis and, and some of these uh, sure, sure. populated sunken continents and high civilizations and this and that. And anyway, he spun a very interesting story right. about an era of which there's you know, virtually no historical evidence. All right, it's and unsupp unsupported. Very unsupported and very unscientific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And claimed that he had, a, you know, he had memory of past lives and it was all very accurate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm a very, uh, what, um, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm skeptical, but I, I, I want proof. Yeah, you'd, you'd like to um, flesh it out a little more and a little more concrete. Yeah, so yeah. I'm like Thomas in the Gospel. Of okay, Thomas. well, you are, you are formerly a reporter, right? Yeah, so I wanted okay. to cut the wounds and make sure that there was something there. Sure. And, and so, so again, we, you know, he insisted that we introduce that in the book in which we did, but I always kind of, you know, as the editor of the book, I was able to kind of put it in quotation marks or, you know. Yeah, that it wasn't, it wasn't supported by data. It, yeah, it was, yeah. it was postulated and it sure. was kind of a dreamy of kind course. of golden age, but yeah, yeah. So for this new book, it's very interesting in the last 10 years, in my, my general reading, but also research for the book, I, I came across the, the actual existence of what I call five peaceful civilizations mm -hmm. that actually existed, uh, you know, roughly 3,000 years ago mm -hmm. uh, or, or before or after, each one of which lasted for a thousand years and 
were entirely peaceful. They had no warfare. They had no offensive weapons. Mm -hmm. There's no archaeological evidence of violent death or massacres. Totally peaceful. The first of these civilizations was the ancient Minoan civilization mm -hmm. in the Aegean. It was based on the island of Crete and other islands. And uh, two years ago, I went to uh, uh, visit one of the islands called Santorini. Mm. Which was, you know, like, for me, it was like going to Atlantis. Yeah, and wow. I discovered that this, it's in fact, it's the site of this beautiful city going back 5,000 years. You can walk through the city. It's one of those kind of hands-on archeological sites where you can literally walk through the dig. Wow. And you can see the, 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 uh, the way the people lived their, you know, and uh, um, their kitchens and their, their living rooms. This particular city had uh, paved streets. It had hot and hot, cold running water. Mm -hmm. It had beautiful fresco art. Mm. And of course, my first feeling when I walked through it and saw the art was, I said, this is a macrobiotic society. Mm -hmm. Look at the artwork and you, know, you get that feeling. Yes, yes. So, opposite to anything in Greece. <laughs> you go back to Athens right. and you walk, you go to the Parthenon, you go to, you know, any of the sites. Right, it's very warlike. Totally warlike and martial yeah. and vindictive. Sure. And, uh, yeah. And night and day, night and yeah. day. Well, that must have been incredible to have that visit. It was, yeah, it was very incredible. Totally opened me up because that was a historical mm. civilization. Mm -hmm. In all the studies that have been done, you know, by archaeologists and and uh, historians, again, they they haven't found any evidence of violence. The civilization uh, was destroyed by by a volcano. Mm. And that's wow, wow! The interesting thing is that all of the the other civilizations are the uh, what's called the Indus Valley or the in, Indus Sarasvati civilization in north east uh, Pakistan and India. Mm -hmm. which existed way before Hinduism or, or Buddhism. Okay. And contemporaneous with the Minoans. And the two big cities were excavated in the early 20th century, Harappa and Mohenjo Daro. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to the Minoans. Beautiful, planned cities, mm -hmm. uh, uh, hot and cold running water. Um, uh, and know, they were also peaceful for, you oh, said, Oh, for yeah. for uh, th at least a thousand years. In that case was about two thousand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and they were all you know all both were devoted to trade and to maritime commerce. Mm -hmm. and they, you know, the, so they're basically into beauty and art. That was their thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the third, third one is in uh, 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 West Africa on the Niger River Valley. It's mm. it's called the Niger River Valley Civilization. Mm -hmm. just excavated within the last like 20 or 30 years. And they found, same story, uh, they had, the capital was called the Gene Gigeno, had 40,000 people. And they're, interesting, their, their main grain was brown rice. Okay. Species down in, in the Far East. Their mm -hmm. secondary grain was millet. Mm. They had advanced um, metallurgy. Their ironwork was the best, one of the best ever in the ancient world. Hmm. But they didn't make any, they didn't use it for weaponry. What did, what did they use it for? Bookware. Okay. <laughs> That's beautiful. The first, the first pressure cookers? Yeah, tools and art. <gasps> okay. And Wonderful. all three civilizations, they have found no evidence of monarchy, no evidence of central administration even. Mm -hmm. They're all volunteer. It appears to be voluntary groups of guilds and trade organizations. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. So you, so in 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 your new book, uh, you, you were able to um, really go from this um, kind of dream of the perfect society in the in the past to finding these. I use the word perfect, and I, I should rephrase that and say peaceful. Yeah. Living, yeah. living without war, coexisting in a harmonious way, yeah. uh, to discovering these five societies that 
um, were actually where the population was actually able to coexist. Yeah, that, yeah. So if you look at the literature, uh, you'll find again that they they share all these things in common. Uh, the Minoans mm -hmm. and the um, uh, the Indus civilization. Their main food actually was barley. That was their main grain. Okay. And the other two civilizations were the first one in the Andes in 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 uh, the Americas. It's called uh, Norto Chico. Again, it was found mm -hmm. like 20 or 30 years ago. So it was way mm -hmm. before the Incas. And, and mm -hmm. their main grain was quinoa. Okay. I think they had a spattering of maize from Central mm -hmm. America, but not much. It was quinoa. And again, they found no, no uh, weaponry, no, no you know, fortifications, no evidence of violent death. Um, mm -hmm. But a very advanced, they had the the quipu, you know, the stringed knotted cords, which they okay. communicate with. Oh, with. yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that right from the beginning, they had that. Wow. And then the fifth one would be the uh, ancestral Australians, mm -hmm. you know, what we call the aboriginals in Australia. Mm -hmm. And again, they go back probably farther than anybody. They go back about 65,000 years. Mm -hmm. Wow possibly even earlier, but anyway, about that time. Mm -hmm. And again, generally relatively peaceful culture, um, uh, mostly devoted to art. And mm. uh, Beautiful. And what do you see as the common elements among these cultures? Well, I say the common elements, the foundation was they were eating grains, whole grain based okay. diet. They weren't vegan, they eat animal food, but it was a right. small, modest part. Okay, so the uh, animal foods were more of a condiment or a smaller portion? Yeah, smaller part for feast sure. days or something, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. They weren't vegetarian, mm -hmm. uh, which is fine. And, uh, the, but I say the second thing is that they were all self-reliant. They did not, as far as we can tell, not any of them had any kind of monarch, any mm -hmm. kind of chief or king or queen. None of them had religion either in the mm. form of sense, you know, of temples or a priest or priestesses. Uh, and also, as far as all the archaeologists can tell, because of the grave sites, they find uh, that men and women were equal. In other words, there was no difference in the burial rites or whatever for men or women. Whereas oh, later societies, you know, the men that got most of the Right, it became grave, uh, grave goods or the yeah, yeah. That, so that was a huge thing. Is and so again, they it, it appears that they they had a sense of what we call the divine feminine. All of these mm -hmm. societies, though they didn't particularly personify her necessarily, mm -hmm. you know, though the Minoans to some extent perhaps did. Their artworks tends to be dominated by women, and uh, but again, but there, but there was an there there was an appreciation of the feminine. Oh, Absolutely yes. So so there was and and like most Paleolithic and, and hunter gatherer societies are are as a rule they're egalitarian. Mm -hmm. There's almost very little difference between uh, men and women status okay. in, in these societies. But this these were civilizations, so they carried mm -hmm. through. Right. It's the most interesting part. Beautiful, beautiful. So so anyway, that was evidence. Uh, you know, not just in one place, but in five parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And and then what happened was that all, at least four of them, the Australians continue to the present day, but the other four were all destroyed by natural disasters. Interesting. Okay, so it wasn't, they didn't self-implode. No, they were sustainable. They were sustainable. Okay, that, uh, cause that, cause that really is the key, whether the, key. the sustainability. Yeah, so what happened then was you had uh, meanwhile, you know, as history develops, as the pace of life begins to accelerate, mm -hmm. then in the in the Fertile Crescent and all these other areas, you have other civilizations that emerge, mm. see, like in China or or a little bit to the east in India on the Ganges, you have Vedic or Brahmanical civilization. Sure. And then you have uh, Sumer and Egypt. Uh, in the Middle East, and then mm -hmm. later the Israelites. And all of these civilizations are fundamentally different from these first five. Mm. And what's most different is 
in that in the um, right almost from the beginning uh, they're violent okay and, and I think in, in I don't think it's in this the first the first book on the spiral history I'm doing actually it's a multi-volume series so this I, I read that there it's this this is volume one part yeah. one I've been working on the next volume which is the beginning of the agrarian revolution turns out that in all five of these areas monoculture comes in okay oh, well what a, what a surprise what a surprise so chemicals are no problem at this point yes it's but but it's the beginning but but monoculture cuts two ways right the thing is that it increases the yield of food yes which to some extent you might say is a good thing because well it, it it appears on the surface to um uh, eliminate scarcity so that's eliminate it, it seems it's, it's, it seems positive. like a po it seems like a positive it seems like a positive Mm -hmm. and allows sedentary culture and civilization to grow and develop. Right. And, uh, and that kind of thing. But the downside is that when you get start growing your own food, cultivating the land, that leads to ownership, right? The okay. land is not communal, but it's now owned sure. by individuals, originally perhaps by churches or by a, a, a strong man. Mm -hmm. Urges then as the king, see. Yeah, yeah. And they own the land. Sure. And that that leads to the whole uh, concept of property and ownership. And then and then, you, and then you get into um, conflict more. Oh yeah. It's, it, kind of it, there's uh, mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then you get the the world's original profession, which is lawyers. <laughs> well, it's 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 interesting because monoculture. Um, has um, we have pandemics, we have um, conflicts, we have um, less peaceful, peaceful society. Um, so it's it's at the root of many um, of the of the hindrances. You might say it's, it's many hindrances. And then my own theory: the more I I I, I meditated or reflected on monoculture, uh, what I realized, Doreen, was that for monoculture for plowing. Right. Mm. They first just, you know, with, yeah, with, yeah, with something, but soon they started using animals for plowing. Sure, sure. Horses and whatever. Yeah. And, you know, to, 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 to handle the plowing required muscle power and of course physical strength. So men had, a, had tended to be larger than women. Yeah, there, there, there could, in, in so, some, most cases, more physical, cases. physical strength. Yeah. So they, began to dominate agriculture. What was mm. called, see? Yeah. Including the plants. See, in the ancient world, before that, you had, again, you had a communal society with hunting and gathering. And yeah. actually, the gathering comes first. And that's why in my book, I talk about gatherer hunters, which okay. is now actually coming into anthropological use. Because oh, that's, I love that. That gatherers, accounted for 75 to 80 percent of the diet. Hunting was right. 80 percent at most. Right. Guess who controlled the gathering? Well, that would probably be the women. It was predominantly the women. And so there was, so the, the perhaps that's creating more of the, the equality that yes. uh, was they exhibiting in those food. cultures. Absolutely. Right. When, so. when farming comes in, they lose control of the food supply because right. the, the, the planting now is done by the men. Yes, yes. And, and it's, it's um, so there's, there's kind of a, um, I'm not going to, maybe subordination is too strong of a word, but both toward animals, dominance of animals and perhaps of um, no, women no, as, absolutely, absolutely. women as well. No, it's more than subordination because right. what happens is that each, each person to work in the fields now becomes mm -hmm. a commodity in themselves. The, you know that labor of the person oh sure sure and so every child or or wife or or man is valuable in the field and in fact that's the beginning of slavery women were the first slaves yeah Before yeah cap captives came in Before right right yeah women. no it's yeah or, or the women became sure. then bartered or or bride gifts for neighbors neighboring kingdoms they would exchange the women you know to make mm -hmm. people 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Totally yeah. They gender. were, um, yeah. And then, of course, the exactly. men exactly. Were, were eating a little bit more animal food traditionally than women, right? We teach that in mm -hmm. that class. Well, not much, you know, maybe. Sure, uh, sure. Yeah. And once they get control of the fields, you know, then they can up that percentage, see, without the women having much say in the matter. Yeah, yeah. No, that that's uh, heavy animal food in domestication. That's animals. definitely, as they say. Yeah. Well, I would definitely say that's food for thought. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, can I think? And it's also, you know, you so goes food, so goes society. Yes, essentially, yes. Yeah, you're beginning to break up. <laughs> I actually wanted to just look at a couple of parts. No, yeah, my internet. Sorry about that. Uh, I think I probably should be okay now. Um, I wanted to talk about, about, you know, back to the spiral of his final revolution of the spiral. I'm going to read this paragraph. Fast Fast food, bionics, climate change, monocultures, GMOs, digital empires, gene editing, and virtual and augmented realities are rapidly remaking our world and leading toward an existential climax between our species and artificial intelligence, AI. Self-replicating algorithms and neural networks are displacing human beings in transportation, communication, finance, law, medicine, and many other domains. A complementary opposite trend root medicine, green technology, and meditation and mindfulness techniques strives to maintain natural, biological, and spiritual evolution. Pass safely through this cataclysmic time and create a sustainable futures. Which of these tendencies will fail? Or as depicted in contemporary science fiction, art, and animation, Will some cybers or hybrid society emerge? The book that we're at a critical juncture uh, in the history of the human species. Um, so could you could you speak to that? What you wrote there? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The spiral of history again, as as <clears throat> Micho uh, uh, first envisioned it. He says it's coming to a climax you know, within the next 10 or 20 years. And I didn't want to date it, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the book. So I left it kind of open, but, but you know, it's, it's clearly, it's, you know, the, the third spiral, it's everything is now happening at once at breakneck speed, everything is converging, you know. So, so there's not a whole right. lot. Every, it's the, the, the accelerating. It's accelerating, it's out of control. You know, and, and that's, yeah, you know, it's like a, a movie, you know, where, where that's why I think people like all these disaster movies is because it's basically one big metaphor for a civilization, you know, the, the plane or the ocean right. or whatever it is represents common humanity. And, you know, sure. we're, we're, you know, there are many sure. that we're precariously balanced on right now. And any one of which, you know, could nudge us off the I, you know, it, it could be. I, I like uh, I like that image. Cl cl cliffs that we're precariously ba balanced on. That's that's I like that. Yeah, yeah. Or we're bouncing off. Them. I mean, I don't like I don't like it, but it, the 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 image the image is uh, yeah um, is very vivid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But one thing I can say is that when, when Mitchell first predicted, when we first worked with Mitchell, like in the early '80s, say, he he predicted. Then he said, you know, Alex. He said. Um, uh, it's all going to come to a conflict between natural human beings and artificial human beings. He was talking about yes. the 23rd. And at that time, he was saying, you know, a modern medicine has created artificial limbs, you know, for mm -hmm. everything but the brain. He says that's the sure. one thing they haven't done. I think now they're working on that. But he, his view was that there would be almost like a bionic species, mm. you know, like the robot you saw in the 1950s movies, 
you know. Of course, of course. Yeah, or, or Star Trek or something, you know, that, yeah. that would kind of succeed us. And, but I think things have taken a much more subtle turn, uh -huh. you know, mm -hmm. in recent years. And what has emerged is called AI or artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. and, it's interesting and, that you chose the word subtle. Yeah, that it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's the kind of the opposite of the heavy handed robots that we were thinking about way back then. But, but the um, <laughs> a, AI now is taking over again very subtly or quietly in, in so many fields. You know, it's taken over the stock market, for example, it's taken over military mm -hmm. decision making, you know, sending drones and killing people all over the world, you know, military strikes. It's taking over very sure. quietly, you know, even sure. the, the legal profession, um, musicology, I mean, so many things. Mm -hmm. And and so I think that's what perhaps I'm very concerned with is that at some point it's going to take over uh, that human beings are going to merge with, with AI. I mean, everybody's talking about that right now. A lot, a lot of these, mm -hmm. you know, putting chips into your hand or into your brain or whatever, you know, so you don't have. Yes, to, yes. I mean, that's the next logical step from, from having, a, having a smartphone you know, is you just, you just talk to yourself. Or you it's just, just, it just is part of your brain. It is your, it is your brain. It is just part of your brain. Yeah. Sure. Sure. And the thing though know, with, with AI is that at some point AI, uh, because it's, it's programmed or becomes self-programming and decides that it no longer needs the human being. And yes. Very well without them. Of you know, course, kind of a, not another type of host or make its own. So in a way, it's like a virus too. Right, right. It's it's it's. Uh, I, I, yeah, that's. Yeah, I mean, it's a staple it's of accurate. science fiction. Sure. So, so there are many iterations of that. But of course. Anyway, it seems that that's kind of where we're moving, and already, you know, people are putting chips in there. Yeah. In yeah. Basis all over the world now. Okay, and, um, but you you present an alternative here. Well, the alternative then, yeah, so again, is, is a more sustainable direction, you know, where we use uh, digital technology, you know, in a wise or ethical way. Mm -hmm. But we, again, we reorient our, our farming, our agriculture, and, um, you know, our whole society in a more uh, egalitarian and peaceful direction. Do you think there's really an opportunity for that, given the rapid pace and... Um the the current um you know where things are currently yeah no i'm very optimistic i think mm -hmm. yeah, there's a huge upward trend in that direction mm. in a way that's even what accelerating much more than the downward trend i mean the downward yeah. trend has been going down now for a long time and we'll sure sure and hopefully without a type of cataclysm that is conceivable but anyway i think the upward trend uh, is there and again, you know, like all the ingenuity that came out during the COVID, sure, in the medical profession and in the schools, right? Yeah, the resource, the resourcefulness the that resourcefulness, was resourcefulness, the resilience among mm -hmm. ordinary people is amazing. Mm. Again, it was ordinary people; it wasn't governments. Mm. That did. And it wasn't. Yeah, some, yeah. It wasn't and experts. It was just the ordinary people banded together and did what had to be done. Right, right. I see that happening, hopefully, with climate change, and then again, sure. step by step. I think the key point, you know, with the dating is that something fundamentally will have to change within about 10 or 15 years. Right. And I think, I think what will change will be the planet's uh, more or less consensus to go in a healthier direction. Hmm. And if it, you know, if it doesn't make that consensus, or if the opposite comes, you know, in which you have authoritarian uh, kind of one world type situation, you know, which tries to maintain, uh, you know, a, a kind of class gender-based society that we've had. Yeah. Then things will fall apart very quickly. But I think if there's some kind of a consensus, you know, where the world can agree to, to get together to go after, to, to change, the climate change, for example, mm -hmm. and up with some kind of a sustainable world government. 
mm -hmm. know, in which to run the world on a, on a much better uh, way collectively, mm -hmm. you know, as well as some kinds of, you know, like, like Elon Musk's Mars project could be a project that does unify the planet, mm -hmm. for example. You know, right, right. Actually, I've been watching that Netflix film called Away. I don't know if you've seen it. It's in I, haven't, I haven't seen it. Anyway, it's on Netflix. It just came out within the okay. last month or so. Yeah. Anyway, it's about a collective effort by, by the world's countries to go to Mars. And you've got, you know, uh, a, a, an international crew of an mm -hmm. American, a Russian, a Chinese, mm -hmm. uh, an African, and an Indian mm -hmm. person crew. You know. Okay. Okay. So you have you you have a broad representation. Yeah. Yeah. Men, women, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. The only conceit that I think is a little far fetched in the film is that that they're all they all have smartphones and they can, <laughs> they can communicate with their families back on Earth without any. <laughs> okay, so it's 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 totally it's totally fluid there. It's totally fluid. So you have it's, the backstories. They all have personal stories. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's not right. like it's not like space travel way back when. No, so it's half space, half Earth, and okay, you know, all constantly just totally back and forth. Well, that's good for the drama. It's good for the drama. No, it's an excellent drama. Yeah, I, I will definitely look at that. Uh, actually, that's, I think this is a good segue into, um, you know, a topic that um, I thought would be interesting given where um, we are with your book um, and the spiral of history and the fact that we're um, reaching the end of a spiral and the transition to hopefully a healthier, peaceful world. Um, we talked a little bit about, you know, you in macrobiotics, there's uh, diagnostic techniques and one of those techniques is facial diagnosis. Um, so given that Elon Musk is so on the cutting edge of artificial intelligence and technology, um, I thought that we could take a few moments and, and, and also essentially Mars as well um, through his company SpaceX is um, at this juncture in history, he's uh, emerging and has emerged for quite some time now as um, perhaps a spokesperson for the new planetary order. Um, some people would say, first with brain injured people in terms of implants in the brain. And so that AI and kind of becoming the merging between human and um, technology, which has already happened obviously with our smartphones to some extent, but in a more direct physical way, um, I thought it would be interesting to sort of uh, just take a quick look at Elon, yeah, can I, can I, I have a picture Any of it. Any comments? Yeah, yeah, can I share screen and- Oh yeah, I'd love that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Can you see my screen? I have to, um, can you see my screen? No. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm hitting the green button. It should. Oh. I hear you. I see. You. I hear you now, but I don't. Okay. Don't um, yeah. see you. Can you can you make me the host so I Do can? Do you want to put your video? Can you make me the host? Yeah. Um, let me see if I can do that. Your uh, who can? Sh uh, who? Can oh, I see all participants. I got. I got you. 
now you can you can share now. You should be able to share now. Okay, let's see. Can you see that? Yes. No. No. Let me just uh, record. We're not recording right now, by the way. One okay. participant can share multiple. We can share holes, and then I've got all participants. So I've got I've got it where all participants can share, and you can start sharing. All participants can start sharing, and okay. multiple participants can share. So it should work. Well, okay, let's try it again. Do you want? To... Okay. You see that? Yes, yes, I see that now. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read now. Uh, okay. I'm impressed. That was the first time I did the screen share. You got uh, you okay? So you're bringing up a, a picture of Elon Musk? Yes. I can see it. Okay. All right. So do you want me to describe a little bit? Yeah. Well, you know, um, you go ahead and and kind of thing, and I will I will interject. Okay. So I I'm showing a picture of Elon Musk, who's uh, as Noreen said, he's one of the leading uh, entrepreneurs of our era, who's the founder of what Tesla or at least the chief executive of Tesla, SpaceX, uh, and many uh, things having to do with artificial intelligence and on the cutting edge, really, of technology. And, neur and Neuralink. And Neuralink, yeah. So in terms of- Yeah, and I, and I thought it would be a really great, yeah. I thought it'd be really great given your book, The Spiral of History and where we are at this juncture in history and in the spiral, of um, you know merging with artificial intelligence or um, going in a direction that really doesn't bode well for humanity or going into or having or creating a healthy, happy, peaceful world. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Visual diagnosis is kind of an art and to some extent a science and that has traditionally been used to, uh, to reflect or observe our own uh, character, personality, and health and sickness, as well as other people. And so we look at facial features, for example, or the <coughs> shape, uh, size of the head or the body, the fingers, the hands, the toes, etc. So. Here with Elon Musk, the, the, the thing that I see most, strikes me most uh, directly is that his face has a very square appearance. Do you see that, Noreen? Mm -hmm. I do, I do. It's, it's, got, it's almost like a perfect, uh, perfect square. It's almost like a perfect square. It's very unusual. You don't see a square face very much. Uh, you see a long face. Actually, it's the not the yeah. Main, it's usually rectang rectangular, oval, or round. It, well, it's the main face today. I would call more more rectangular or oblong. You know, it would go down to about here. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but it would go down a little bit longer. So this I is can't a, see it. I can. I can. Okay. Sure. Okay, this is this is uh, uh, unusual, though it is one of the five major face shapes. Uh, I might say that the main the main face uh, shapes include kind of a inverse triangular triangular face, where the forehead is wider than the bottom part. Like I have that kind of a face, like this. You know, it doesn't come to a point. Right, like an inverse triangle. A little bit inverse, yeah. Then you have the opposite, which is more of a of a triangular face, where the down here the jawline is is wider than actually than the, the top of the head. Yeah, that's a mm -hmm. kind of a rare case today, but it was a traditional one. 
Then you have the oval face, okay, and which is, uh, uh, you know, our more elliptical type of face. Then you have a round face, you know, which is not so much oval, but, but almost circular. So those are the five main types of faces. Mm -hmm. And they all have to do, of course, with our ancestry. Uh, they're mostly constitutional. In other words, what we're born with. Uh, but to some extent, and then particularly how, how they have changed since birth is what we call our condition. In other words, the kind of foods that we ate, our social and lifestyle influences, the environments in which we live, you know, will we'll influence, uh, you know, us at all these different levels. But anyway, the square face in this case yeah, is, so is extremely young face, what we call more contracted, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. very close set eyes, you know, very right here, everything is very closely gathered together. So it's what we call very young face. So this is somebody who's very dynamic, very strong, very powerful. He's governed uh, almost, you might say, by a need for security. Mm -hmm. That's the overriding need. It's very interesting. Uh, because what he's doing, but he's doing Could enough. you elaborate more on that? Yeah, he's not, it's not, for some people it can be on a personal level, you know, in other words, they, they make their home, their castle, and you know, and they, everything is about this person, again, very, very young. They're very material oriented. They're very um, acquisitive in a way. They're very successful. So they make their own, their own home, their own kingdom, very strong and powerful. Mm -hmm. But if they're socially oriented, sure. they make the world very powerful. And he has a definitely mm -hmm. very strong social uh, judgment. So that means he's seen the... Mm -hmm. So he's very futuristic in that regard, that he sees the world. You know, it's not just for himself or his family, but he has a, a true regard for improving the world at many different levels and actually on a planetary scale. You know, either changing our planet or, you know, moving to some other planet, you know, which is very quixotic in a lot of ways. But I think that's what's driving him. Also, interestingly, Right. You may recall there's something called Nine Star Key. In yes, of course. Yeah. To, just for our, for our listeners and viewers, just say what Nine Star Key is. Essentially, it's, it's a kind of a traditional uh, or Far Eastern kind of astrology system or, or energetic system looking at our date of birth and, and again, the tendencies and, and uh, influences, you know, at that kind of a level. Sure. And he's yeah. what we call it he was born in a two soil year. So two soil is mm -hmm. also very earthy. It actually corresponds with the mother, uh, the mother, or you might say the mother goddess <laughs> to some extent. And uh, so like a mother, he almost has a- So, so it, like, like, like mother earth? Mother earth, exactly. Yeah, so, and so, and so because he has that social mm. orientation, again, he's looking at trying to help the planet and trying to, you know, be very supportive, encouraging and nurturing the planet as a whole through all of his many activities. It's interesting, I was looking up, you know, some of his background. He describes himself uh, as a socialist, which is very interesting, you know, because it's, it's a rather what, bold and unpopular type of of label for for most Americans, unless you're a supporter of Bernie Sanders. Right, right. He's, 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 it's, 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 yeah, I was going to say Bernie Sanders comes comes top of mind. Yeah, Bernie's a little bit too. Yeah, I I didn't come across that. Yeah, but I didn't know he just describes himself. Anyway, Bernie Bernie's anyway is a humanitarian. I think is a better word for it. Right, yeah. right. Socialist is a term that can easily be misconstrued. It can be misconstrued. There's so many types of socialists. But anyway, social meaning yeah. coll collective or something beyond, you know, just his individual. Working, working, for the collect, working for the collective good. For the collective good, yeah. So there are a lot of types of socialists. Yeah. So anyway, you can see his, con okay. his features are very contracted. His eyebrows actually go down like this. This is a type of a very gentle person as a rule. 
So his his I see when the eyebrows go down more peaceful. Yeah. And um, and so he's by nature. He's compassionate. He's kind. He's that kind of person. Um, but the but he has major health problems, <laughs> which are beginning to show okay. up now in his features. Okay. You see, number one is underneath the eyes here. You see their bags beginning to develop, right? Sure, sure. Yeah. Yep. So that that relates to the. This is this is from a macrobiotic perspective. From a, well, macrobiotic and broadly from Far Eastern. Um, sure, or, Fa facial, facial diagnosis. Facial yep. diagnosis, but these correspond with the right. kidney. So it shows there's a lot of. I see. So, in the kidneys. And it's beginning to yeah. build. And this is uh, related to such negative emotions as fear, particularly fear. And in excess, sure. it can lead to paranoia. Right, right. Yeah, the kidneys are, emotionally, the kidneys are, are really associated with fear. And, 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 I, and if you look at the complement to fear, it would be security. Exactly, right. The opposite would be security. Yeah. yeah, so he's fearful, uh, again, to some extent, rightfully so, about the planet, but also there's an element here of, of a little tendency toward extreme fear. You look at uh, President Trump, for example, he's got kidney problems too. In fact, every major organ in, in Trump is afflicted, you know, which helps to explain his behavior. But uh, now I hear you. Yeah, but a lot of things, other things here, like he's got very puffed up cheeks here. You see? And in fact, all of the pictures of him. Yes, I do. Prominent things you see. Those correspond with the lungs. So there's a lot of stagnation in the lung area that's building up in him. Okay. I didn't come across anything in my research whether he smokes or not. I don't, it doesn't look like it. Uh, so it's probably, again, mostly dietary. Dietary uh, related. Yeah, but that has to do, interestingly, with uh, also with uh, um, security and insecurity, uh, happiness, unhappiness. I don't know. There's an element of sure about that. There's some set. I see. So there's you're seeing some stagnation there. Big stagnation here. Across right. here, it's harder to see in this picture than in other pictures, but he's got, you can see there's some coloration, discoloration here. This is hypoglycemia, this chronic right. low blood sugar. Which is fairly which common fairly in the common US. In the modern society, but it. Right, but, in, in, our, in our high stress world. High stress world, but it also means that the emotions are going up and down. Okay. And, can lead then to when it comes down, it can be depressed. Uh, sure, sure. There's big, big swings, big, big swings. swings. Oh, yeah, swings of emotions. Also, the tip of the of the nose, it's you can see it's beginning to harden. It's not, I wouldn't call it serious, but compared to many people in society, like even Trump, but it's it's beginning to harden. You can see a little bit there. Sure, sure. Heart, heart and circulatory system. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so the tip of the tip of the nose is related to the oh, current coronary, condition. Coronary artery. Coronary. Okay. okay. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. Then the lips have uh, to do with the uh, intestines. So a swollen mm -hmm. lower lip shows that the the large intestine, particularly, is um, swollen. Mm -hmm. So his microbiome is not so great. Got to mm -hmm. be careful. Mm -hmm. So oh. there could, yeah. Right. So there could be some um, uh, fermented foods could be helpful. Very helpful. Yeah. And, well, if you look at, okay. at Mus' dietary pattern, you begin to see why this is. He doesn't really have any, uh, what you might say, what uh, a lot of health consciousness. You know. So he eats. You know, in, in terms of diet. Yeah. I mean, he's, he, his most famous thing that he tells people is that for breakfast, he eats Mars bars. 
<laughs> well, that's, that's uh, actually, that's what really, I didn't hear that about Mars bars, but uh, I oh, listened recently to. <laughs> but, but it's true. He, he eats on the run. He said if he could do without eating, he would. He, he doesn't, it's not for most. Okay. He said he can do without exercise. Sure, sure. So he's driven. He's I did hear that. He's passionate, you know, for many things, but but taking care of himself is not part of it. And part, yeah. curiously, his mother is a nutritionist. Oh, I didn't realize that. Well, wow. Again, I don't want to, you know, analyze him, but again, there may be some family dynamics there. Okay, okay. So, uh, you know, many times when the mother or the parent is uh very passionate about something that the child will go in the opposite direction go in the opposite direction not not talking from in sometimes for a while yeah. for a while for a while or yeah. resist resist the resist for a while or resist yeah I think not speaking from personal experience of course yeah i think so. i think he was just i think he's just been driven by technology and by you know he's he just fell in love with you know the, that kind of world you know a, discovering new inventions and you know it's a it's a very passionate type of world and people get lost in which is great you know and he's been one of the creative geniuses in that world it's sure been, sure hasn't been taking care of himself in the way that he probably should because he's now he's yeah. almost 50 years old and so um, yeah yeah it's uh yeah i don't see anything particularly imminent with him but but you never know because he has this kind of up and down dietary lifestyle and his family life has been apparently very up and right. down. So, you know, I think he needs okay. to take better yeah. care of himself in the future. And actually, I think, you know, that would give him you know, a deeper intuition, you know, for some of these projects that, that he's involved. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's, so, uh, really wonderful and um, uh, the, the shift that's rapidly taking place and um, um, perhaps with a macrobiotic diet and um, and enhancing intuition uh, yeah. he can be one of the friends to sh usher in a new era for humanity oh absolutely yeah I mean his brother apparently actually who he works with closely one of his his brothers actually has some vegan restaurants, so you know he's oh, probably somewhat aware of I, that. I didn't know. Yeah. So and again, it doesn't have to be macrobiotic. It could be you know a good balanced plant based diet. But anyway, moving in a healthier direction. Oh. Yeah. So I I of course of I course think there's a good chance that 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 could that could actually come about, you know, sooner rather than later. Okay. But anyway, I would hope so. Great. You know, that is, in a way, that's the missing link, you know, for him and so many people. And that whatever he's doing, he can do a lot better, you know, if he had that stronger biological foundation. Yeah, that, that's really the realization. And perhaps uh, um, Corona is the reckoning that whatever we're doing, we can do a lot better. Exactly, so, yeah. Um, do you want to... I ha do you want to um, unshare the screen and then we can okay. just um, conclude? Yep. Great. Thanks, Alex. That was that was um, very good. Thanks for that. Um, well, any anything that you would like to add or um, to what we've already talked about? We've talked about a whole wide variety of things. So. And I really, really appreciate you taking the time today. So, uh, no, I, I know I enjoyed talking with you, and, and hope that your listeners, you know, found it found it helpful. And uh, you know, you can post some of my contact information. I definitely will. I'll I'll, po I'll make sure that planetaryhealth.com. Yeah, that's planetaryhealth.com or macrobiotic summer conference. Your website uh, and. The Macrobiotic Summer Conference, which happens every year in Western Massachusetts. Yeah, and um, we have a winter conference in January. That's our next big event. Also uh, at Eastover? No, oh, okay, great. 
online. Yeah. And I know you're currently working on a diabetes project. We're working on a, yeah, with, uh, you remember Berkshire Medical Center here in, in the Berkshires, you know, which is the big hospital. Yeah. Yeah, believe it or not. Yes, they, I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. yeah, they endorsed our project. So it's, you know, we that's, just that's wonderful. To clear up and uh, we're first that speaks to patients to us. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's a breakthrough. Yeah. That's so great. And perhaps with COVID-19, that that project will be accelerated once things uh, it could get work. out of the yeah. current stage. Exactly. Th there'll be more interest, you know. I would hope so. That's great. Um, yeah, well, thanks again. Thanks so much. I'll, I will make sure all of your websites and everything are in the show notes. So, um, okay. I'll well, say thank good day. You. Thank and all the best with your new, <laughs> your new programming. Uh, hold for a moment. I'm going to stop recording.